If we hear a cell phone or pager, I'm going to assume that you are a donor <laughs> or a recipient and you will be asked to leave quickly. I love it. My name is Mary Pearl. I'm an al -Anon who is happy, joyous, and free. Amen. I'd like to thank uh, Martha and Lois and everyone that's worked on this and, and for inviting me down. And I'd like to thank Louis Caliente. Oh, I love that. Are you trying to say you're damn good looking? I've known him for a long time. Long time. And he is, and he's as good as he looks. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> take that how you want to. Uh, <laughs> I'm really glad to be here, and uh, I have family members here tonight, you know. I have uh, a girl that I sponsor is here. I have one of my grandbabies here. I have uh, uh, a, a friend from New York that's here. I have, I'm, just, uh, I'm just so grateful to be here. As Minnie Pearl would say, I'm just so proud to be here. Yes. And uh, do y'all want to have some fun this weekend? Okay. Well, you know, I found that for me, uh, being in recovery and staying in recovery, if it hadn't have been fun, I wouldn't have kept coming back. Because I'm an, you know, I'm an adrenaline junkie, and I, I thrive on the adrenaline, and there's nothing that gives me more adrenaline than recovery. You know, and being around other people who are in recovery, so it's just real nice. Uh, I left home this morning. It's, we've been having record heat wave. However, it wasn't on the plane. I like to froze to death all the way here. And then I got here, and thank God it's warm. So I thank you for the nice warm weather. Uh, I want to start, like I said, well, this is uh, going to be uh, this weekend about how to apply the 12 traditions to your relationships. And first, I want to do a disclaimer. I am not conference approved. <laughs> and for that, I am very grateful. <laughs> Uh, what I have done, I have reworded the 12 traditions, taking the principle involved in each tradition and applying it toward a relationship. Sometimes we have a hard time making that stretch, you know, and like, how do I apply this in my life at home? And so this uh, came as a result of a situation that happened in my group in 1988. There were nine of us sitting around that were all living in happy sobriety and we all wanted a divorce. <laughs> so we asked an attorney in, our, in my home group if, uh, because there were nine of us, could we get a group discount? <laughs> because we were just sick and tired of this crap. And uh, she said no. And so when she said we couldn't get a discount, you know how we are. Well, in that case, I guess I'll have to stay. <laughs> you know, you gotta buy stuff that's on sale just because it's on sale, you know, that kind of thing. And so we decided to sit down and figure out what we were going to do. And after a long thing of prayer and, and meditation, you know, it occurred to me one night, if the traditions could get groups of sick, admitted sickos working together in a cohesive manner to get things done, why couldn't the same group sickos in your own home practice these things and work together? Because it seemed a shame that people, two people in recovery couldn't get along. You know, it just seemed a shame to me. Why is that? You know, and it's because we're still sick. And I don't know about you, but when I came into the program, they told me to take the focus off the alcoholic, put it on myself, and boy, did I. And no longer did he matter at all. <laughs> so that was sort of how this was evolved. I wanted to, to read you to show you there is a difference in how we look at things, you know. Uh, dear diary, now this is her diary. Tonight, I thought he was acting weird. We'd made plans to meet at a bar to have a drink, and I was shopping with my friends all day, so I thought he was upset at the fact that I was a tiny bit late, but he made no comment. Conversation wasn't flowing, so I suggested that we go somewhere quiet so we could talk. He agreed, but he kept quiet and absent. I asked him, is it my fault that you're upset? He said it had nothing to do with me not to worry. On the way home, I told him I loved him, and he simply smiled and kept driving. I can't explain his behavior. 
I don't know why he didn't say, I love you too, darling. When we got home, I felt as though I had lost him, as if he wanted to do nothing with me anymore. He'd just sit there and watch the television. He seemed distant and absent. Finally, I decided to go to bed. After 10 minutes later, he came to bed. And to my surprise, he responded to my caresses and we made love, but I still felt he was distracted and his thoughts were somewhere else. He fell asleep. I cried. I don't know what to do. I'm sure his thoughts are with someone else. My life is a disaster. His diary. I didn't catch any fish today, but at least I got laid. <laughs> We just don't go according to the same thing, do we? <laughs> you know, my problem has always been that I know what you're thinking. And you know it's been my experience that you're never thinking what I think you're thinking. You know, as my sponsor put it, he who walks in another's mind is lost. <laughs> and that's how I've done relationships, uh, be it male, female, male, male, female, female, however, all through life is trying to figure out what you're thinking and then act and respond accordingly. In other words, I'm reacting off of everything I think is happening instead of being honest about what I'm feeling, you know. So those are some of the things. Uh, I also uh, I have some comments that were, uh, I thought were really cute. Uh, from kids, you know, kids are very perceptive. You know, they haven't built up their walls and everything yet, and so, what do most people do on a date? A little girl age eight said, dates are for having fun. People should use them to get to know each other. Even boys have something to say if you listen long enough. <laughs> on the first date, they tell each other lies. That usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. <laughs> this is Martin, age 10. You know, he's learned, you know. Uh, is it okay to kiss someone, Pam, when they're rich? She's seven. <laughs> Kurt, age seven, says, the law says you have to be 18, so I don't want to mess with that. <laughs> the rules go like this. If you kiss someone, then you should marry them and have kids with them. It's the right thing to do. Howard, age eight, and my mother. <laughs> you know, and, and we laugh, but when we think about these things, these are some of the things that we realize that a lot of how we interact with each other in relationships has a bearing on what we have heard growing up, what we've observed. And let me tell you something, people, especially those of you who have children, uh, I, I never had any children. I saw yours, that was enough. Um, <laughs> but uh, children are very, very honest. They haven't learned to build these walls and everything. But what you see is not always is what's happening. And what you say doesn't mean near as much to the kid as what they're seeing you do. If you say, don't smoke, and you smoke, you have no validity. If you say, don't fuss, and you fuss. You see what I mean? That kind of thing. And we don't realize how much the, the kids are catching on. Because, I mean, this is what I saw in my family. Uh, I'm a change-of-life baby. And uh, my mother was 41. My daddy was 54 when I was born. And so I never saw my mother and father argue, ever. They didn't talk that much. Uh, <laughs> But I thought that if you had a good home, you never fuss or fought or had any arguments or what have you. Now, I'm sure they must have had these behind closed doors, not in, in my presence. But, you know, I, I, so I don't know if it's okay to fuss and fight in kids or to let them know a certain amount that you don't agree or what have you. But on the other hand, it's not this way either. And you know how we are. We're sort of black or white. And we don't know about shades of gray. And that's what I learned in here in, in the recovery, is that not everything is black and white. And sometimes there is some balance in the middle in the shades of gray. Uh, having given you the introduction here on why that uh, we decided to redo the traditions, and, I, and what I was telling you about the divorces and all, that was true. That was true. Because now here we, uh, there were like, say, nine of us that were all married and had someone, back when I came into Al-Anon, believe it or not, uh, everybody in Al-Anon had somebody in Alcoholics Anonymous. 
It was mainly husbands and wives. It was only later that we began to get the, the children and the cousins and the uncles and the dogs and the cats and all like this in. And so we only had Ellen on, you know. And we were very close with Alcoholics Anonymous, and I think it's really great where we find areas where AA and al -Anon work very good together. Because, you know, we all got sick together. It's really nice if we could get well together. You know, I really believe in that. And uh, so anyway, it seemed amazing to me that if we were both working such a good uh, program of recovery, how come we couldn't get along? You've got a lot of history of when you didn't. And one of the hardest things to put in the past is the past. Isn't that amazing? Because, you know, it's like J.D. told me I was the Healy Street historian. Because something would happen, I'd say, this reminds me, back in 1969, <laughs> I had on that blue dress. You were wearing gray pants. You know, I never, ever forgot an injustice done to me. You know, I might not say anything about it, but I never quite got past that, you know. And that was some of the things that was hurting me in the now, was the fact that I couldn't get past those things. So with that, we're going to start with tradition one. The way I've worded this is our common welfare comes first. A healthy relationship depends upon unity. Now, we learned that unity is one for all and all for one, the greatest good for the greatest number. You know, I learned this by going to service. It was always amazing to me. If you, how many of you have been to an area assembly? Isn't it amazing how you can have knockdown, drag out fights for hours, and then when it's all over, go, ah, that was great. <laughs> that didn't happen in our home. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing didn't happen there. I found, though, in order to have unity with another human being, I have to have unity within myself. I have to be okay on the inside. I have to have it all together on the inside. And in order to do that, I must have unity with my higher power. So that's where the unity is going to have to start. We cannot bring into a relationship something we don't have. And so many of us are broken people, and we say, okay, I'm broken over here, he's broken over there, together we'll go together, and we will be a person. Two broken halves does not make a whole person, I'm sorry. That's just crumbles combined, just sort of like fruit salad crumbles, you know, you're just right there in the middle. It doesn't work that way. You can't bring healthiness to a relationship if you don't have it. In any of those qualities that you want in a relationship, if you don't have those, you can't bring it there, and the other person can't fix you. And it seemed like all my life I had been born with this loose umbilical cord that was still hanging. And I would go around and plug it in here and plug it in there and plug it in here and plug it in there, trying to make it okay, trying to become whole. See, there's something missing, and I don't know what that something is, because everything I think, once I get this, once I do that, once I have this, once I'm married here, once I do that, I'm going to be okay. And if you're not okay, none of that is going to make you okay. And so you're just plugging around, and the only thing that that's going to plug into, unfortunately, the receptacle on that plug only fits one place, a higher power. That's where you plug into, and that's what makes you whole. And so you have to develop the relationship with your higher power. Now, it's real hard to have a relationship with a higher power when you are the higher power. <laughs> or when you have someone else being the higher power. Because human beings are not equipped to be higher powers. We are much lower powers, trust me. You know. And see, this thing, I seem to think that I had been born with a, a fantastic ability to always know what other people ought to do. I never knew what I needed to do, but I knew what you needed to do. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You know, and I've met a lot of people who are exactly like that because they've been trying to tell me what to do. And you know the thing about when people are telling you what to do? Even if you want to do it, you can't. They're not going to tell me what to do. You can't tell a know-it-all anything. And I'm never going to admit that I don't know it all. So I'm not teachable. And see, being teachable is humility. And that is a God quality. 
And if I don't have that, I can't learn that, you see. So it all has to do with the connection with a higher power. Now, God, how did, you know, how do you, how do you develop this? And I call it God consciousness. How do you develop God consciousness? You know, God brings good orderly directions into my life. When I am plugged into the power that works, then I have a better quality life. I make better decisions. My relationships are better. I don't go off looking for some sick person to fix. You know, isn't it funny? You look at somebody and you say, God, he loves me. He needs me. I like that better. Because see, if he, can, if he needs me, I, I've got job security. <laughs> So what you do is you just keep creating a need to be needed, you know. And when you get that need to be needed, that fixes your little sickness on the inside. You feel like you have worth. If you don't have worth, that other person cannot give you enough worth. It, it's impossible. It's trying to fill a bigger hole and their person is capable. And so the only person, like I say, can do that is God. So how do you do that? Well, you first start out at what I call the RPMs. Now, you guys here, you know what RPMs are. Women see this on a car, and we don't really give a damn what it's about. You know, you're just on the speedometer there. Who cares? <laughs> you know. But it is what revs that car up, you know. That's when you put that foot on the accelerator, it goes, vroom, you know. And that's power. That is power. And what gives you that, the RPMs? Reading, prayer, meditation. That's what revs your inner engine up. That's what revs your soul is those RPMs. You know, we don't have it in here. We have to put it in here. And it's like, why do we have to go to so many meetings? Why do we have to keep coming back? Can you eat enough at one meal to last you the rest of your life? You've got to keep going back on a regular basis, don't you? You have to keep replenishing. If you could eat enough at one particular meal, we could float out of here like balloons. Some of us try. You know. <laughs> but the bottom line is you've got to keep going back and you've got to keep doing it. So there's never going to be a point when you cannot improve your relationship with your higher power. There's just not a point where you can... It's, it's one of those things that it grows and grows and grows and it becomes deeper and more ingrained. And you know, in our home group, we, we talk about that the repetition strengthens and confirms until faith becomes natural. You repeat it. You hear it over and over. I have a girl that I sponsored years ago in the program and she said she left the program, came back several years later. She says, my God, you're still saying the same things you were saying when I left. <laughs> I said, you ever think about why? <laughs> so she had to leave again. <laughs> and then her, her husband of the day uh, decided to kill her and shot her in the head and committed suicide. And she lived and she came back and she said, y'all are still saying the same things. I said, what does it take for you? You know, she's back out there. She's still, she's still trying to get it the hard way. You know, I don't understand that. But the bottom line is we have to keep having this spiritual feeding. And that's what the reading, the prayer, and the meditation. And you learn to practice the presence of God. And I asked my sponsor, I said, well, that all sounds great, but how do you practice? She says, well, you get up in the morning and you say out loud, good morning, God. Okay, I can handle that one. You see, I did not, when I got here, I did not have a relationship with a power greater than myself. My father was my higher power until I was 12 years old. My father died, and I had gone to church and all this, and I had heard that God loves me and going you know, to take care of me, and, and I said, that's a crock, because if God loved me, he wouldn't have taken my daddy, because my daddy loved me. I never questioned one time my daddy loved me, and I knew my mother did not, and here, this loving God left me with a woman that didn't like me and whom I hated, so how could God love me? So I had a lot of spiritual retardation, if you will. And I turned my back on any kind of spiritual thing right there. I just believed it was a lie, what I'd been told. And I went on. And then when you're going off on self-will, because if you're not in God's will, you are in self-will. We That's the way we are. You know, it just slides real quick. And if you're in self-will, they call it self-will run riot. And so self had done all this stuff to my life. And when I got in the program, oh, and I want to mention this too. If you are not royal founded in the 12 steps, 
If you're not working the 12 steps, it's going to be almost impossible to work these traditions because we're going to ask you to do things that you won't be able to do if you don't know how to work through the steps. I just want to tell you that. Anyway, so here I am. I'm going through life, and I don't know how to live. And I don't realize it's this spiritual deficiency that I have. And so my sponsor says, you say, hello, God, you make that connection. Then she said, I want you to go, and I want you to look in the mirror. I said, this is dumb. And she said, when you look in the mirror, I want you to say, good morning, Mary Pearl. There's nothing going to happen to you today that we can't get out of together. Love God. Have you ever heard anything more hokey than that? <laughs> oh, God, I can't believe it. And so, I, I, you know, I'm going to prove to her it doesn't work. I'm going to do this crap just to prove to her it doesn't work. And, you know, the days that I did it, I had better days than the days I didn't do it. You know, and so of most of my stuff in the beginning, I did my, everything my sponsor told me to prove to her it wasn't going to work for me. Don't you know my case is different? I'm different, you know. This might work for simple people like y'all, but I am very complicated. <laughs> so what she was trying to teach me, she says, and then after you do that, then you say, come on, God, go with me today. And then you invite God into your car, you know. And I, and I say, okay, I'll play this game. So I invite God into the car. I even buckle him up. <laughs> I'm driving along, and she says, talk to God all the way to work. And I'm going, okay. Now, people are going to think I'm crazy if I'm sitting in my car and I'm talking to a buckled up nothing over here. <laughs> you know? Now, one of the girls in my home group at that time, <laughs> she had a little doll that she had buckled in, and she'd talk to the doll, so maybe people think it was a kid she had over there. <laughs> and I thought, that's a doll. But now stop and think. Who's going to see you talking to nothing or to the doll? People you don't know. Why do you care what people you don't know think? I don't know. <laughs> but we seem to, don't we? What will complete strike? Now, we don't give a damn what the people living with us think. <laughs> But God forbid a complete stranger should think we're balmy. You know. Now, I can tell you that when God is riding with me buckled up, I do not flip people off near as much. I don't yell and scream and curse at people near as much. When God is right there, because see, I have an awareness that God is right there. Because I've buckled him up. I'm taking him with me. And all of a sudden, I was a very, very hostile, aggressive driver. I was aggressive and hostile no matter where I was. But you put me behind the wheel of a car, and it's like, Vroom! power, zoom, I'll kill, I'll kill. You know, and don't you dare think you're going to pass me on the road. It's not happening. You know, I mean, we may play leapfrog up and down the freeway. You know, I'm going along and you pass me. I can't have you passing me like that. Because normally what they do is they pass you and get in front of you and then slow down. Have you ever noticed that? They're trying to control my car. They can't control my car. I'll show them they're in control of my car. Because while I'm showing them, they're in charge, you know. And so I zip around them and slow down. And then they zip around me and slow down. And then I zip around them and we're doing this down the freeway and then all of a sudden they get off. And I'm three exits past where I need to be. <laughs> but I showed them. <laughs> like I said, you know, whoever you want in control, if you want God or not in control. And you have to take God with you. And then I would get to the office, and I would take God with me into the office, and God would sit in my office, and then I would take God home with me in the afternoon. And then I would take God, and then at night, I would say, thank you. And then I would go to bed. And then, in fact, what happens when you go to bed? You can't sleep. you got to worry. My mother says, if you don't worry, you don't care. <laughs> now, see, I heard that when I was a little kid. So, therefore, you have an obligation now to worry. If you care, you worry. 
Well, you know, there's another thing I learned in the program. If you pray, you don't have to worry. Because then it's God's problem. Now, who do you want solving the problem? You or God. I'd rather have God work on it while I get some sleep. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> but my staying awake all night trying to figure something out does not make me better equipped to handle it the next day. You know, because now I'm tired. And when I'm too tired, I'm more easily to get angry. I'm more easily for my thinking to be off whack, you know, because I'm not getting. Your brain has to have some rest or it doesn't work as well. Now, I used to say I work better under stress. <laughs> You're an idiot. <laughs> you do not work better under stress. You get more of an adrenaline rush that maybe feeds that adrenaline need, but you do not function better under stress. You function better under calm. I had an experience uh, a month ago this week. I was flying home. I had been uh, in Akron at the city hospital where Bill and Dr. Bob and Sister Ignatia were, and I was doing a step study weekend up there, and I flew from Akron to Cincinnati where I changed planes, and we're waiting in the plane. They have a mechanical delay, and after about 35 minutes, we get on the plane, and we're heading toward Little Rock from Cincinnati. And about 15 minutes out of Little Rock, and at 37,000 feet, um, the plane is on fire. Well, I mean, I'm sitting there and I, now wait a minute. The cabin is filling with smoke. The alarm is going off, going fire, fire, fire. And I'm going, now we had a conversation this morning. Were you asleep? <laughs> um, I remember that safe travel prayer. Do you remember that this morning? This is what my mind is doing, you know, and the, a lady behind me saying, oh my God, I have two small children. Now I'm going, oh, please shut up. And uh, well, you know, when you're in a situation like that, you don't need to hear a bunch of uh, madness, you know. And the lady seated right across from me, she's got her daughter with her, and her daughter's about 40, and they're saying goodbye to one another. And the, the pilot comes on, he says, our, our left engine is on fire, and he said, I'm going to try and shut it down and see if that will contain the fire, and they'll put, you know, their little chemicals or whatever on it. And, and, uh, and he says, we're going to be making an emergency landing. And I'm thinking, that sounds good to me, <laughs> the landing part especially. And I'm sitting there, and I am immediately, I'm saying the serenity prayer over and over and over. Why? Because that's what I've learned to do. In times of stress, to calm myself, you don't go, I don't need an adrenaline rush. The fire alarm was all the adrenaline rush I needed, you know, and more so. And so I'm sitting there, and, and all of a sudden, the lady across from me, she touches me, and she says, honey, you all alone. I said, no, ma'am, I am not. God is right here with me. And I realized at that moment, I needed to hear those words out loud. Because what you hear makes more impact than what's just going on in your head. And immediately I began to be calm on the inside. And obviously we landed and we were okay, you know. But it's one of those things, you know, it's like that. I realized when I said it that, yes, God is here with me. Now, I don't know what that means as far as outcome, but I do know that I'm going to be okay whatever way that goes. And that's because I have learned to have that presence of God, to practice that presence of God, to realize that God is there and make that a part of my life. I wasn't singing la ti da but I was calm on the inside, and I was able to listen to instructions. Now, I've heard the, the flight instructions a million times when you get on an airplane, but you don't, you hear a different set of instructions during the crisis. You hear things like, Unbutton your blouse or shirt two or three buttons in case you have to come out of it in a hurry. Take off your glasses and any jewelry. Put it in your pockets. How to get the brace position. When to do. Follow these things exactly. And you know it's like you can. You can do those things. But it's like, all right, at that point in time, I'm having to trust. And, you know, after it was over, I was talking to the pilot and the flight attendant. And they said that other than in simulation, they had never done that drill. And I said, I am so glad you paid attention. <laughs> now, to show you human nature, all right, they bus us from the, uh, being out in the weeds about a block away from the plane after the fire department was met, met us right there at the end of the runway and surrounded us and 
they took us to a remote thing. We got out and we're standing over in the weeds watching. They sent these buses to get us, take us to the terminal. We're sitting there and they'll tell us your stuff will be brought to you after a while. And um, there's these two guys and they're saying, God, can you believe it's taking this long to get luggage? <laughs> and I said, excuse me. <laughs> Don't you realize you get to get your luggage? You could be scattered all over the damn countryside. I can wait hours. I'm on the ground in one piece. What's the matter with you? You know, where's gratitude? You know, but that's human nature. You know, the crisis is over. We live. Where's the damn luggage? You know. But that's the way we are a lot of times because, you know, it's like you've got to have that conscious awareness because with that comes the gratitude. And like I said, when I would lay down at night, I could not think of things to be grateful for. I knew how to worry. I could think about all of those kind of things. And so I was told, make a list in your mind. Think of something with a letter A and tell God how grateful you are for the A's in your life and the B's in your life and the C's. I never made it to Z that I wasn't asleep. And you're going to bed and to sleep with a positive thought in your head instead of a negative and you're going to rest better. Because there's nothing you can do about that. Sometimes, you know, I would get up and I would write down what was bothering me. And I said, God, I'm going to give it to you tonight. In the morning, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to worry with it again. But tonight, I'm going to give it to you. You know, and then that way I could get some rest. And so that was practicing the presence of God. And then you've got to learn acceptance. Acceptance. Accept the things you can't change. Let me tell you, I had no problem accepting somebody else's advice and directions when I was there in that plane. I don't care if she said, stand on your head and stack BBs. I'd have gone, where are they? I'm ready. You know, you have to accept things the way they are. The greatest form of love you can give to someone else is to accept them exactly the way they are. You know, even when we're at our worst, we want people to love us. And people who don't deserve love need it more than anybody else because they feel so unloved. They can't love themselves enough, you know. So accept them the way they are and don't expect them to be something they're not. Just remember, most of the time, we're not being our 100% potential either. You know, we're all out there. And if you focus on the positives of others, you can watch them grow. But when you focus on their negatives and keep bringing them up to them, it just keeps pushing them down, pushing them down. You know? Did you know that your serenity is inversely proportional to your expectations? When you're expecting a lot from someone else and they don't fulfill, then you lose your serenity. But if you don't expect a lot from other people and just accept them as they are, then you have a lot more peace of mind because you're not disappointed. And do you realize that when you put expectations on somebody else, you're putting a standard up there? It's like put, going to the uh, emotional Olympics and you got to make all tens. And if you know you got to make all tens, you're going to screw up because that's too much pressure. And then you're going to feel real bad. Feel real bad. Don't do that to other people, you know. If the higher my expectations, the lower is going to be my serenity level. And acceptance is hard. And, you know, it's like I can accept uh, that alcoholism is a disease. I can accept that I have the family disease of alcoholism. It's the little things. Have you ever noticed the big things in life we can pretty much take in stride? It's those little fleas and ticks of day-to-day -day living. Why does he leave the seat up? <laughs> you know, those are the little things that drive you nuts if you think about it. It's those little bitty things about people. And, you know, my life goes by all the time, and I have lots and lots of different things I have to learn to accept. And one of the things that I learned several years ago, and I'd like to share this story with you, is about my cat. I hate cats. <laughs> When I was a kid, my sister Siamese cat jumped on me. I had to have 18 stitches in my leg. I don't like the way they twirl around you. I feel like I'm going to get pounced on again. You know, these old things, are, they leave an impression on you, you know. So I'm a dog, I've always been a dog person. Daddy raised bird dogs, and I helped him train bird dogs. And so I'm, I'm a dog person. 
I decided my husband is the great gardener. He's the great landscaper. I mean, our yard always looks fantastic. And I decided, well, you know, I think I'll do something out in the yard. Of course, that gives him cold chills. Because <laughs> I don't do I don't manicure the grass with scissors, you know, like J.D. will. And so I decided I would make a nice flower bread in the front. And it would be, you know, like about 50 feet across and about 15 foot deep. Just a little flower bed. And... <laughs> Well, you know, nothing, if it's worth doing, do it up. I mean, for God's sakes, if a little's good, you know, a lot's better. I mean, everybody knows that. And so I made me a little template. I was going to make a free-form flower bed. So I made a little design out there, and, and I made a little template. And I went to the quarry, and I wanted some rocks. I had seen these river-washed rocks from New Mexico. And they're all about, the, you can get them, and they can get them about this size, and they're white with little black flecks in them, and they're just, they're just gorgeous looking. And so I went out there to the quarry, and I had my little template that I laid out, and I'm blowing my rocks out, getting them all, one here, one there. Took me a whole day out there at the quarry. The guy said he'd never seen anything quite like that. <laughs> but these rocks are expensive, and you want to get exactly enough. You don't want one too many. You don't want one too few, so take the pattern and go out there, you know. So I get all my rocks and get them paid for and take them back home and I lay them all out. And I'm so pleased with them. And then I got me some hostas to go across the front of the flower bed. I got a solid, a variegated, solid, variegated, solid, variegated all the way across. And then I planted elephant ears all against the brick of the house. Got all those elephant ears planted in. And between the two, I planted 17 flats of impatience. Now, those are gorgeous little plants, little tender plants. You know, that's a lot of holes, people. 17 flats, you know. Took me several days out there. And, you know, and, you know after the first flat or two, you're wishing to hell you didn't have those 17 flats of impatience, you know. And so then I got my fertilizer. Well, now at home, we have on the TV, they advertise miracle Grow. And there's a guy on there, he said, got a 50-pound tomato, got it with miracle Grow, so I want miracle Grow. <laughs> and so it says on the bag of the miracle Grow that if once a month that you fertilize with miracle well, if once a month is good, <laughs> once a week should be better. <laughs> now I have four-foot-tall impatience out there. I have, <laughs> it's something to behold. People are driving by going, my God, have you ever seen anything like that? Is that not amazing looking? And I'm going, yes, they're mine. I'm waiting to do my miracle grow endorsements, you know. <laughs> and one afternoon, I'm looking out there, and J.D. says, what happened? And I said, I don't know. There's this hole in my impatience. There's a big hole, and they're all broken over. Now, they're real tender, and once they break off, even with the ground, they're not coming back again. And so you have to replant, but no matter what you do, the ones you replant are going to be as tall as the ones that are already, it's ruined. My flower bed is ruined. <laughs> what did this? A cat. <laughs> now I have all these bird feeders and everything out there, and I have all these pecan trees and stuff, and I've got squirrels. And so what I have done with my giant tall flowers, I have created a jungle for them to pounce on the birds and squirrels from. And there's this great big calico cat that's out there in that flower bed. And I'm telling, and I found out from some of the people in the group that calicos are always female. I don't know how they know that, but I'll take their word for it because I don't know cats and I really don't care. All I want is the cat out of my flower bed. So before the meeting one night, I said, does anybody know how to get rid of a cat? Well, as many people as you have at the meeting, you're going to have a way. You know, that's the reason we should never discuss problems in a meeting because you'll get 50, and no matter how many people you got there, you'll get a, a reason from everybody instead of just everybody sharing experience, strength, and hope on a topic and take, well, you'll hear what you need to take home and solve your problem if you'll listen. You don't have to have the meeting all about you, you know. So we believe in our group that we share recovery, not sickness. So here I am before the meeting sharing sickness. And I want to know how to get rid of the cat. So I got all these suggestions. So I go home and they said, mothballs. Cats can't stand the smell of mothballs. So I go and I get me all these boxes of mothballs. You could smell my house from two blocks away. <laughs> Didn't bother the cat. The cat came back. 
And so then another one said, well, get that uh, cracked cayenne pepper that you can get in those big things at Sam's. So I went and got two gallons of cayenne pepper, and I put it all out there in the flower bed, and guess what? I have a Mexican cat. <laughs> Loves that stuff. Gets it all out and looks like that. I hate this cat. So I went through several other things, and then finally, uh, I decided, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's really irritating me that my flower bed is ruined and more holes are appearing and I'm just absolutely rabid. And so I decided, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot the cat. I have this uh, pellet gun. And so I pump it up to three and the cat's out there and I go out the door and I see the cat and I beat off and I go, bam! And the cat goes, meow! Shot it in the butt, you know? And so the cat came back. So I pump it up to six. I go out my door now, it's like this. I'm like this and the cat's like that, you know. We're going back and forth out there in the yard. And so the cat sees me and starts to run and I shot her again. She goes, meow. But she came back again. I have an alley cat. She keeps doing the same thing, expecting something different. I pump it up to 10. I go out the door, the cat sees me, I see the cat, I take a bead, I shot the cat, I missed the cat, but I shot a hole in the next door neighbor's house. <laughs> Not good. Okay, summer's over, so is the flower bed. We wait next spring, guess what? We do it one more time. I plant my impatience in the flower bed and they get big and here comes the cat. The cat came back. You know, it doesn't occur to me that I'm doing the same thing expecting it to be different, you know? It never occurs to me. And so by now I have many suggestions from people all over the country. <laughs> One of my favorites, a girl in Oregon, sent me this email and she says, cheap plastic forks. She said the ones that are real picky on the ends, if you put them in the handle first, then the cat can't walk on them. I can't either. <laughs> I have to weed the flower bed. This doesn't work. And so finally I decided the solution was kill the cat. Just kill the cat. I have a 45, I'll blow it away. I mean, it's just that simple. That thing has irritated me one time too many. And I got a telephone call about this time from a friend of mine that raises golden retrievers, show dogs. And he was telling me he lives out in the country and this little stray dog kept wanting to service his females. And so finally he shot this dog, but he didn't kill it on the first shot. And he says, I'll never forget that scream till the day I die. Well, what if I don't kill the cat on the first shot? <laughs> Thanks for sharing. <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I am so discouraged. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like, Mary Pearl, yes, you're trying to change the nature of a cat. A cat is a predator. They go out, they stalk their prey, they kill their prey. This is what cats do. You're trying to change the nature of what the animal is doing. It's never, it's never going to work. You're going to have to accept the nature of the cat. <laughs> Man, that just, I mean, it was like, my God, how could I have, now two years, I've been fighting this whole thing. Two years. Because see, I don't go down easy. <laughs> so now my sponsor is one of these, and she says, accept something to the point you wouldn't change it, even if you could. So you act as if until it becomes. So I go out my front door and the cat's like this and I said, welcome to my yard, FC. You can be my yard cat. Do whatever you want to out here. Just make yourself at home. And I go back in the house and my husband is trying not to laugh because he's within striking distance. And he said, I don't believe it. I said, I'm trying to accept FC. So, <laughs> the next morning I get up, I'm doing my reading, my prayer, and my meditation, and I happen to look out my front window, 
And there's one of my happy little squirrels gnawing a limb off of my bonsai tree. <laughs> oh my God. And I go running out the door, screaming, stomping my feet, get the hell away from my tree. Where's my cat? Where's my cat? Where is my cat? <laughs> Eat this squirrel. Eat this squirrel. <laughs> there's a guy driving past. He's going. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what is your problem? And then I look down, I'm in my underwear. <laughs> I'm so obsessed with all this. I go tearing back in the house. I go, oh my God. I never saw FC again. All I had to do is accept it and it went away. I said, God, you are so funny. Well, a few years after that, I was up in British Columbia, and I was at this little seacoast town called Seashelt, and as I went in the, the little uh, inn there where I was staying, on the, uh, where you check in, there was this giant calico cat. And I said, I'll be damned. FC, you went to BC. I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, God has a sense of humor. God has a sense of humor. You know, you've got to accept people just like I had to accept the cat. You gotta accept people as they are instead of how you want them to be. You know, one of the biggest challenges of my life was trying to accept my mother for the way she was instead of being the way I wanted her to be. You know? How many of you have troubled children that they're not the way you want them to be, but you have gotta accept them this the way they are? Because if, as long as you don't accept people the way they are, you're constantly in conflict with them. And then they're not going to change because they back up. We don't like people trying to force us to do things. Even if we know we should, we still don't like people making us do that. And then I also have to accept today how my sister is. Now, my sister and I have uh, always had a wonderful relationship, but in the year of uh, 1999 in November, my sister uh, died in the car with me. And we rushed her to the hospital, and um, uh, they revived her, but Dorothy's not with us. You see, she was down 10 or 12 minutes, and so she has no memory anymore. She can think, and she can function, she can dress herself, she can get up, feed herself, whatever. She just won't remember. It's like uh, there was a bunch of us out celebrating my birthday the other day, and we were having lunch, and one of the girls turned to Dorothy, and she said, did you enjoy your egg roll? Did I have an egg roll? <laughs> You know, and we just go ahead and laugh because that's the way it is, you know. And she says, you know, I can't remember. And I said, well, you know, it's nice that you can remember that you can't remember. And she said, I'll think about that. <laughs> you know. But, you know, that, that has been one of the hardest things to accept is the fact that my sister will never be as I have known my sister my whole life. And when I do not accept things, I try to fix them or change them. I keep wanting them to be different. And then when I keep trying to do it, I just make the healing. It becomes like an octopus. It gets just stuck on my face no matter where I go. There it is. It's just stuck on my face. You know, I can't get away from it. That's what an obsession does for me. It's a thought that supersedes all other thoughts. And if, I, if I'm not careful. And then I have to be willing. I have to be willing to do my part in a relationship. I have to listen to the ideas, the feelings, and the complaints of others. I've got to be able to be wrong. I've got to let them worship, be right sometimes, you know. I have to do more than what I think is half in a relationship. Anybody that tells you a relationship is 50-50 is in la-la land. 90-10 on a good day. And sometimes I'm putting in the 90 and sometimes I'm putting in the 10, you know, if you want to get honest about it. You know, the, the first healing in my relationship with my husband came over one of these little dumb things. You know, J.D. got sober and he decided that he wasn't going to drink anymore. He wasn't going to smoke anymore. He wasn't going to do this. He wasn't going to do that. And uh, it's like he was going to become Mr. Pure overnight. Well, I was still smoking. And so I would wake up in the morning and guess what? He just quit buying cigarettes. He would steal mine. You notice I said steal. See, drama. Got to have the drama. It wasn't like he smoked some of mine. He stole them from me. 
And so I was throwing this little fit about it one morning. I said, how dare you smoke my last cigarette? And I just went on and on. And I'm following him through the house right at his heels. Don't think you're going to get away from me now. I'm like a bird dog on the point. I am going after my prey, you know. And uh, he decided he would um, go over to my mother's. Now, see, that's an insult to injury because my mother likes him better than she does me. <laughs> you know what? He doesn't try to change her. I didn't notice that for a long time. Why does my mother like my husband? She's always like either husband I've had better than she likes me because they just let her be right all the time. I hated them for that. Why don't y'all tell her the truth? And they'd say, because we want to get along. <laughs> I can't hear that. It's not fair, so I'm not going to do that. I'll fight with her. Thank you. <laughs> And the phone rang, and it's a girl from my home group. And she says, how are things going? Things are not going. They are not going at all. J.D. stole my last cigarette. And she says, well, God love it. She says, do you not have any money? <laughs> yes, I have money. She said, well, do you have a store nearby? I said, yes, we have a little neighborhood store about three blocks away. She said, well, then why don't you go buy you some cigarettes? You missed the point here. <laughs> He stole my cigarettes. He should be the one to replace them. She says, he's not going without the cigarettes. <laughs> oh, okay. And I told her, I said, well, I'll tell you what I did. And I told her about this fit out there. She says, oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I said, why? And she says, because now you're going to have to make an amends. <laughs> what? She said, well, for throwing that fit and cursing at him and doing all that, do you owe him an amends? I said, I'm not on that step yet. <laughs> she said, uh, for wrongs of now, we do rights of now. And she said, and if you don't, I'm going to call your sponsor. See, they rat you out. <laughs> and I don't like it, you know, but I don't want to get ratted out. So I go over to my mother's. And as I'm walking, he's out in the back. He's mowing her grass. And he sees me coming. He stops a lot more and he squares off. You know, he's ready. And uh, I walked up to him. And seeing that now, in, in my line of sponsorship, uh, we've been told to make an amends. You don't say, I'm sorry. Sorry doesn't change anything. You know, we say, I was wrong. What can I do to make it right? That's what we say. You got to say, the hardest part is that I was wrong, you know. And so J.D. looked at me and I said, I was wrong. And he said, what? And I said, I was wrong. Now he's hard of hearing. He's got a 65% hearing loss. I'm like, I'm wrong, you know. And then finally I said, I was wrong. And he said, You've never ever said that before in all our married life. That's a lie. <laughs> that is a lie from the pit of hell. <laughs> and all of a sudden, you know, your mind goes back to that searching. You know, you're going to tell them when and where. Searching, 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 searching. <laughs> not found, not found. <laughs> I didn't realize that no matter what fight we had ever had, he always had to be the one to say he was sorry, he was wrong, I would never give in. Why? When your self-esteem is really, really low, you can't afford to be wrong. When you don't like yourself, you can't afford to make another mistake. Because then you feel like you are a mistake and you just can't handle it anymore. And that was where we were. And so I looked at him, and he had tears in his eyes. He says, I just, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you for saying that. And I told him, I said, I shouldn't have jumped on you. I said, J.D., it's our money that buys the stuff. It was just, I was just pissed off because I didn't have a cigarette when I got up this morning. You know, now how important is that cigarette? Is your life going to be run by the cigarette or are you going to have God run your life over here? You know, and I was letting an addiction affect my relationship, just like the drinking affects our relationships. 
You know, those kind of things. I was doing the same thing to him with my addiction as he did to me with his addiction. You know, same kind of thing. You know, and I am so grateful today that we got past all of that stuff. You know something? Tuesday of this week, J.D. and I have been married 37 years. Is that amazing? The fact that we stayed together and worked through all this. Well, we learned that you have to put that past in the past. You can't build a good house with burnt lumber. You've got to put that stuff behind you and quit using it to beat on you with. You know, it just doesn't work. You've got to be honest. And you've got to be honest with yourself. You've got to quit blaming other people for why you are the way you are. It was your fault. You made me mad. You don't make me anything. I choose to be mad or not to be mad. If you hit my sore spot, I'll get mad. Why? Because I've got a sore spot. Now, what heals the sore spot? God heals the sore spot. You can't. And if you ever noticed, get a sunburn. I bet y'all have that down here in Florida. We do. You get a sunburn. Nobody ever taps you on the back until you get a sunburn. Then everybody, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> And it's the same thing when you've got a sore spot, but everybody's going to be hitting on that sore spot, you know, till you get that fixed, you know. You've got to take certain things out of your vocabulary. You're not allowed to blame other people. We have choices. We are not victims. We are volunteers, people. We volunteer. We stand out in the middle of the freeway and say, hit me if you can. <laughs> and then you get hit. <laughs> How could you do that? Well, you were standing out there. What did you expect? You know, we put ourselves in places to get hurt, so we have to stop that. You got to take, you make me out of your vocabulary. You make me feel. You hurt my feelings. We got to stop that point in you, 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 and do it me, me, me. I choose to be hurt by what you said. I choose to have my feelings hurt. I choose to get mad. You know, no matter what you do, I have a choice. And I can't be blaming you anymore because if I do, then I put my serenity under your feet for you to dance on top of. You know? And then it's shame on me. It's not shame on you. You've got to take justification and rationalization out of your vocabulary. You know, that's just where you give yourself a good reason for a wrong behavior. That's all it amounts to. I used to love, there was a woman in AA years ago, she's been dead now for a long time, her name was Holly Martin. And she used to say, justification and rationalization are just like masturbation. You're only screwing yourself. <laughs> and that's the truth. You've got to learn to communicate with one another. You need to develop these skills in order to become willing to make yourself vulnerable. When you talk to somebody, you've got to be able to tell them how you feel about things. Now, see, my thing was always this. J.D. would tell me how he felt. And I would explain to him why he shouldn't feel the way he felt. You know, and so all I do is I discount your feelings when I do that. I'm telling you, you're nuts that you feel the way you feel. Because, see, what happens is he would say something that would scare me. And I didn't want to admit to being afraid. And so then I would convince him that what he said wasn't valid and what he was feeling wasn't valid so I don't have to deal with my fears. It's, it's that fast talking for slow thinking stuff, you know? That's all that amounts to. See, J.D. came in one day and he says, Honey, I think I'll build a boat. Oh, my God. Now, J.D. never does anything in a little way. I could see the Queen Mary in the backyard. <laughs> see, fear magnifies. Fear is that giant magnifying glass that you put it on a little something and it goes whoop, like that. You know, it's that telephoto zoom, you know. And immediately I saw thousands of dollars going down the drain that we didn't have, you know. And so I said, you don't need a boat. Now, I don't believe him saying anything about I need a boat. He said, I'm going to build a boat, you know. It wasn't anything about needing or whatever. It was what he was going to do. And I said, uh, and besides... I said, uh, we'll have to uh, pay more taxes. You have to assess that boat, and you have to have insurance on that boat, and you'll have to have a trailer for that boat. And I began to go through all the reasons why he didn't need the boat. And I said, and besides, we have a membership down at the club. They furnish a boat. Why do you need a boat? What if I want to fish someplace else? You don't need to fish anyplace else. 
<laughs> I want a boat. No, you don't. <laughs> don't tell me what I want or don't want. Okay? You don't need a boat. <laughs> and so, all of a sudden, things begin to accumulate in the backyard. <laughs> a couple of which were aircraft drop tanks. <coughs> These are big tanks that come off when the planes are, have that extra and they drop the tank, you know. And we live over by the air base, so they're easily gotten. And, and I'm going, what are you doing? He says, I've decided I'm going to make a big pontoon party barge. Now, see, it's no longer a boat. Now it's a pontoon party barge. And these are going to be the pontoons, you know. And pretty soon, I mean, I begin to see it go out there in the backyard. And it begin, and it was huge. It was so big that I'm going, he can't get it out of the backyard. <laughs> we have fence and gates. There's no way for him to, he'll have to take it out by helicopter. And every time I'd make that observation, it got bigger. And it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger out there in the backyard. Now, it's a couple of years. We still have the boat in progress out there. And it's like, my God in heaven, I can't believe it. And I went to a workshop on communication. And it was talking about how when you're communicating, you talk on the same level as the person you're talking with. If they're talking feelings, you talk feelings. If they're talking facts, you talk facts. But don't try to talk facts to someone with feelings. And don't try to talk feelings with someone with facts because you're not communicating. There's the boat. My feelings, I didn't communicate. I used facts. He was doing his deal. It didn't matter to him. He was doing his deal. And I'm going, oh my God. And they said, not only that, sometimes we walk all over the dreams of people when we try to convince them not to do something to keep us from having to feel fears. And I realized that my fear of financial insecurity was so great that the boat was a giant threat, and that's the reason I was so against the boat. I didn't care if he had 14 boats as long as it didn't affect me financially. I don't want to have to lose one penny of anything I want to do for what you want to do because I'm self-centered. That's what it amounted to. I'm self-centered. I wanted it. I want what I want when I want it, but that means that you've got to wait. And I begin to see all these things about me. It's, it's about me. See, that's what self-centeredness is. It's all about me and what I want. And I went back and I told him, I said, well, I want to tell you that I was wrong, what I did about the boat, and I'm going to tell you why. I said, because every time you'd mention the boat, I'd see dollar signs. And he said, well, you know, all I wanted was a little fishing boat, but when you told me I couldn't have a boat, he says, that's, that's what we have out here now. <laughs> And I said, in other words, you rebelled every time I made a comment about the boat. And he said, I, I named it for him. I called it the POS, the piece of shit in the backyard. <laughs> and he said, I didn't appreciate that. I mean, I went out there and painted it on the back end, you know. <laughs> he said, I didn't appreciate all that. And I said, no, and I was wrong. And so a couple of days later, I look out there, and my husband's a welder, so he can build anything. And he's out there, and he's got his cutting torch, and he's, he's disassembling the boat. And I said, what is it? He says, this is what I wanted. He said, I never wanted this in the first place. All I wanted was fish. So he's made. And I found out the other day, my husband thinks he's a fisherman. He's not. He's a boat builder. Because he's building now. I mean, he's like on boat number six. He builds these boats and sells them. People want these boats and things, you know. And it's like, he's very happy out there building his boats. But I had to be able to learn how to communicate to him, you know. And there's another thing. When somebody says something to you and you get a weird reaction when you respond, what did they hear you say and how did you say it? Ask them, what did you hear me say and how do you say it? Because especially J.D. with a hearing loss... You know, he'll tell me things back that sound like what I said, but it wasn't what I said. The words are just not the same. And I can say, well, my God, I can understand him doing something weird when if he thought I said that, but that wasn't what I was saying at all. And so then we can talk about it instead of getting your back up about it all the time. And sometimes you don't realize your tone of voice. You know, J.D. told me one time, he said, um, 
I said, why is it that I can tell anybody at the office what to do or whatever, and they don't give me this crap back that you do? He said, because I'm not paid to mind you. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't realize that I came across like I was giving orders all the time. He said, I feel like you're the first sergeant and you're issuing orders to me all the time. And I found out it's because I never said please, I never said thank you, I never said would you. I would just say, take out the trash. <laughs> now, what I thought I said was, darling, sweetheart, precious one, <laughs> would you be so kind as to take out the trash? At your own convenience, of course. <laughs> but what I said was, take that crap out now. <laughs> you know, those kind of little misunderstandings. <laughs> And you have to have an open mind, for God's sake. You never learn anything if your mind's not open. If you think you know everything, nobody can teach you anything. Because you know. And you've got to remove yes, but, what if, and I know. I mean, those are six words that will get you in a lot of trouble. And another thing is adverbs. You know, we're big on who, what, when, how, where, all of those things, the big questions. That's where we are gatherers of information that you can't do anything with once you have it, but you've got it. You know, that's the al way. I called my sponsor one day. She's not home. Her husband answers, and I'm going to tell him about this argument J.D. and I are having, because whoever's on the other end of the line gets a call. <laughs> and he said, Mary Pearl, it takes two fools to argue. What? He said, two wise men will not argue with one another. Nothing is ever solved. And a wise man won't argue with a fool. So obviously, it must take two fools to argue. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I didn't particularly like that conversation anyway. You know. I had a problem with need versus love. Like I say, if you need me, you'll keep me longer. You know, that, that, was, that was my feeling. And uh, I did that especially with my mother. I needed my mother's approval. All my life I tried to do things to get my mother's approval and I never could get my mother's approval. And I'm really glad because you see, I was looking for love. And if she'd approved me, I would have confused approval with love. Because you can love people and not approve of what they're doing. You know, there's a big difference between them. And uh, taking hostages, you know, I had to take hostages in order for me to be okay. I did that. I had to have friends one at a time. I couldn't have a whole bunch of friends at the same time because I didn't know how to deal with that. So what I do is I take a hostage and I keep that one till I completely wear that one out. And then I take another one over here, you know. And never get rid of one until you get another one on the way. That's one of the things I found out with men is never get rid of one until you got one waiting over here on the side. Because if you don't have one, there's something wrong with you, isn't it? Isn't that what we're told? You know, man, woman, you go together, get on the little ark, and you live happily ever after, you know? <laughs> you like that, huh? Thank you, Noah. <laughs> it is laughable. It is laughable. That wasn't how it was for me. And you have to develop some balance. And who knows what that is? You know, that's what people who have sanity use, balance, you know. At home, I have, I have an engraved rock. I love it. It says balance. And it goes, whoopee, whoopee, whoopee. It's, not, <laughs> it's the most out of balance things. Who wanted balance? I want things the way I want them. I don't want balance. I want my way. <laughs> then you have to do that meditation and, and prayer. And it's God, show me how to be a partner a true partner in the sense of the word, and learn to accept progress rather than perfection, not only with my partner, but with myself, you know. I've got to change my attitude, and my attitude changes as a result of the prayer and the meditation. That's the only thing that successfully changes it. You know, I've got to realize that he's a human being, and he makes mistakes, and I make mistakes. And as I learn, I have to do it all. It always has to start from me. Anything you want, from someone else, you have to be willing to do that. 
You know, if you want unconditional love, you have to give unconditional love. Because, see, there's a spiritual principle. Anything you give out comes back to you. And so you're going to have to be able to give it out. And a lot of times we're such scorekeepers that we want it coming back from where we give it. You can't limit God like that. God will give you what you need back. It may not come from where you give it, but it will come back to you if you're looking. But you see, if you've got tunnel vision, only putting it on one person. I did that with mother. You know, I kept wanting mother to give me this unconditional love. My sister was giving me unconditional love all my life. I took it for granted. I kept looking for mama to give it to me. I didn't give Dorothy credit for doing it because I wasn't getting it where I wanted to get it from. You know, God always gives you everything you need right where you are, right at that moment in time. Everything you need is right here, right now. If you need it, it is here. Because God goes ahead and plans in love. God loves you more than human beings possibly can. God created you and he knows what it takes for each and every one of us. He knows what it's going to take for us to hit a bottom to where we're going to depend on God. You know, it's that God hole in us that keeps us searching with that umbilical cord, you know. And when you plug into the source, then the search is over and the joy begins. It's just that simple. And there's a God language I found. You know, with people, I try not to get people to promise me anything because people will disappoint you. There's words that only God can hold up, and that's promise, always. Never. Those are God words. Because think about it. When have you always anything? When have you never, no matter how hard you try, if you promise someone you'll never do something, something will happen and you end up doing it. You know? Because those are God kind of words. And those expectations. You know? Those kind of things. You got to remember, we are a fellowship of equals. And no one in your relationship is any bigger, better than you. And no one is any lesser. You know, that we're all the same. You know, basically, we're all just God's kids and we're just trying. We're trying to grow up. And the book tells us, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that we're, immaturity is our basic problem. We're self-centered because what is more self-centered than little kids? And we start out that way, you know. We learn that if we cry, somebody sticks something in our mouth or cleans our butt, you know. I mean, we know how to get what we need, you know. And, we're, and we go and you have to teach a child to not be self-centered and to learn to share and to be kind and be loving. It's not our nature. And we just don't seem emotionally. We're just a bunch of emotional and spiritual retards, you know. We just don't grow up. And in here we have the tools and we're with other people just like us that are learning how to live. And it's like give each other a break. Tradition two, for our family or relationship purpose, there is but one authority. A loving God as he expresses himself in our informed family conscience. Each partner is God's trusted servant. Neither governs. I've been a dominating person all my life. I know you find that hard to believe. <laughs> This is where I play God. This is where it gives me the illusion of power. You know, and as long as I'm around people who will allow me to dominate them, it's just really hard not to do it because that's an old habit. I like to, be, I like to feel indispensable. It's, it makes you feel like you have the divine right to tell them what to do. And um, people who need to manage and control to that degree are scared to death. Because the more fearful you are, the more need for you to have to control that around you. You get into that micromanagement, you know. You got to be able to control every aspect of the deal so that this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen or whatever because you're afraid. You know, it's like I would ask my husband when he was out drinking, I'd say, where were you at? Who were you with? What were you doing? What am I going to do with that information? What does it matter now? He's home. I don't care. Who are you with? Where were you at? What were you doing? And then he tells you, Oh my God, I didn't want to hear that. Because you have no control over that. And let me tell you something. I know about me. If I hear a problem and I don't have a solution for the problem, 
It's not a problem. You go into denial. Denial is the most wonderful thing. It helps you retain your sanity. Because as long as you don't have the problem, you don't have to deal with it. But the thing about denial is reality keeps chipping away at it time after time. You know, it's like when it was obvious to me that he was a womanizer, I didn't want a divorce. I didn't want to leave him, but my ego says if you confront him and, and, and do that, then you're going to have to, so you don't look. You don't ask those questions. You don't want to find out the truth because if you find out the truth, your ego is going to make you do something you really don't want to do. You know, we're like that. Um, Where unity doesn't exist in your relationship, love cannot exist without being damaged. Because when you've got a manager or a controller, that person is going to squeeze the life out of love. I had a friend in the program many, many years. Some of you may have been privileged enough to know Ramona from Oklahoma. But she used to talk about the fact that her daddy had, uh, her, her daddy was an Indian and they raised little chickens. And she said they had these little tiny, tiny chicks. And she, he put one of them in her hand. And she said the little bird tried to uh, jump. And so she squeezed the little bird and it just struggled and struggled and struggled. And he told her, he said, open your hand. And said she opened her hand and the little bird just sat there in her hand and it looked around and it pecked at her ring and it just sat there. And he says, Ramona, that's love. He says, if you, the more you tighten down on love, the more you squeeze love to death, right? You know, you just kill love. But you've got to learn to give them the right to look with the open hand. And if it goes away, it was never yours in the first place. Do you, you know, it's like, why does God give us a choice to love him or not? If you're programmed to love God, then you don't have a choice. And what does love mean to God? But if you choose to love God, that love means everything. Because it's what you want to do. And that's the truth with someone else, too. If you're there because you have to be there, not because you want to be there. That kind of thing. Low self-esteem. Low self-esteem will not allow you to make mistakes. Control was comfortable for me, but with it comes responsibility. Because you see, when you're in charge and something goes wrong, <laughs> guess who's responsible? But now what do you do when that happens? Well, you didn't follow the rules. You didn't follow the script. If you'd have done what I told you to, like I told you to do it, how often I told you to do it, this wouldn't have happened. 